uh, entitation and and multi-level have come from the Boston data set. The Boston data set is included in the machine learning uh, workbench so that it is one of the standard data sets. The reason that it became a standard data set is because it was used in a book on ex exploratory, uh, exploratory data analysis and regression diagnostics by Belsley, Koo and Welsh in 1980. So that the whole, uh, the 506 census tracts in Boston uh, the data set was, was printed in the book. And since it was printed in the book, it then became available on Statlib and so that people could download it and use it. Um, uh, Kelly Pace and a student, uh, um, first name I don't remember, so it's Gilly and Pace, Pace and Gilly, wrote two articles in the mid-90s on the data set, pointing out the fact that the original analysis uh, was using spatial data, and that if one took account of the spatial data, then one uh, take a, took account of the fact that the observations were spatial and were uh, the residuals were autocorrelated. Then, <coughs> then inferences on the original, the inferences from the original paper by Harrison Rubinfeld would no longer stand. So that it's it's a data set which has been around for a long time and is also used a lot. In, uh, in trying stuff out. Among other things, it's used a lot in the machine learning uh, community because it's a, it's, a bit, it's a data set which lots of other people have tested routines on and then the idea is to find out what it is that is, uh, is um, uh, so which, which, which algorithm is best at predicting house values. Uh, the the underlying problem or the, the underlying research question was the estimation of willingness to pay for clean air using air pollution values and house values in, in a hedonic regression. And many people will not read further than that, but actually the way in which the the data were and the way in which the data were 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 co data collection was organised uh, had a had a significant impact. Uh, one of the findings from Pace and Gilly, uh, ninety seven, was that the estimate of the air pollution uh, coefficient in the model cha changed when uh, uh, when residual spatial autocorrelation was taken into account, so that it it rose from minus not. 0.006 to minus 0.004 and its standard error widened so that from being being a variable which which was seen as being a, a significant determinant of house values together with many other variables to which I'll come uh, it was a less significant determinant of housing values and because the uh, the thrust of the original article was to use the coefficient estimate to uh, to get a, a, a grasp on the willingness to pay. So that uh, how, if people were willing to pay more for houses which had cleaner air, then you could say that this would be what they would be willing to pay to abate air pollution in areas with higher air pollution. So that the that that a good deal of the original article is concerned with that calculation, but the but the size of the willingness to pay crucially depends on the accuracy of the estimate of the coefficient on on uh, on air pollution. Uh, in the original study, they looked at uh, particulate matter and at NOxes, but found out that there was very little difference, so, so concentrated on on NOxes. Uh, as I was uh, concerned to elaborate yesterday um, at Nauseam, uh, this is a case where the uh, air pollution values were copied out across neighbouring groups of census tracts because they weren't available at the level of the census tract but were available in a way which I'll describe in a moment uh, more broadly. Uh, so we need to look at which, obs uh, which observational units were used in assembling the original data set uh, and uh, a possible alternative. 
Now, the, so one of the possible alternatives are what, what, what I'll be calling the model output zones or, or using a, the, the, the air pollution variables, the particulate matter and the NOx, and the NOx is, is what's used here, uh, were not observed. They were generated by a deterministic meteorological model, which was then calibrated against a small number of, of uh, observation stations. And it was taken as an annual average uh, NOx level. In Boston in the 1970s, so it was used against uh, 1970 census data, so it was from the early 70s. Uh, much of the NOx was generated uh, in two ways. One was from point sources. There were power generators, there were ships in the harbour, things like that. And uh, the, the NOx was also generated by uh, by road traffic, uh, but principally along the main uh, the main radial roads running in and out of the centre of in and out of the centre of Boston. There was a good deal of traffic downtown because people were commuting in and then commuting out again. But downtown was also where the power generator and the harbour were. Consequently, there were both point source and traffic uh, sources there. And the actual loading was uh, was um, um, distributed across the model output zones using a, a numeric uh, using a, a numerical model, a meteorological model. Because if if the wind had been mostly going from downtown, which is on the coast, out to sea, then obviously it wouldn't matter if the wind was blowing from the sea inland then it would spread the point source pollution uh, inland uh, from, from, from downtown. So that the estimated levels of, uh, of NOx are themselves um, associated with unknown error. It would be possible, and I believe that the Fortran, Fortran code for the original meteorological model is also available, and maybe the meteorological data is available to rerun the uh, the estimation so that we could capture differences in model calibration settings feeding through into differences of of uh, in 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 the nox value but it is also it's it's also a, a, a measurement error um, setting it's possible to try to use, as one might in econometrics, to use an instrumental variable to instrument the, the, the NOx. But in those cases, or in cases which have been attempted, then usually there's so much noise in the instrument that, that any effect on housing values is, is, is removed. However, there were only uh, um, a, a, well, there's a smaller number of model output zones than there were census tracts. The census tracts used in the original uh, in the original analysis there were five hundred and six of them, uh, and all of those five hundred and six were used, and the NOx values were copied off from the model output zones. In addition to that, some of the some of the covariates were only observed at the town level, and the towns could have from one census tract in them. To over 30, or a large, large number of census tracts, which would then all have the same number, uh, or would then have the same uh, covariate values. But first, the, the response. The response, because house values were measured by census tract, they were measured as a weighted median. Uh, the question in the 1970 census was the following. If you are living in a one-family house, which included apartments, uh, which you own or are buying, what, do you th what is the value of the property? That is, how much do you think the property, house and lot, would sell for if it was for sale? So this is, this is a volunteered uh, valuation. It's not a valuation from uh, an actual transaction. And there are no transaction data available. So the house value is in itself a, uh, uh, a movable feast. So that Harris and Rubinfeld used the median house values in 1970 uh, US dollars for 506 census tracts. 
there were a number of other census tracts in the uh, area which they were considering, which was not just Boston itself, but it was the Boston's uh, standard metropolitan statistical area. And there were some census tracts which had no such dwellings. They were, they were excluded from uh, analysis. Some of those tracts were downtown where the levels of pollution was highest. This is, this is not, it, it means that the, the, the data set, they were using data which was, re, it was reasonably possible to acquire. Uh, but if you were going to do a hedonic uh, regression based on house values and the places with the highest pollution had no houses, you might say, okay, there are no houses there of this category for this reason, or you might say that all of the houses which are in the area with highest pollution are actually not in this category, so that they're not self-owning. So that they're rental properties and possibly social housing. But we don't know because it's not, it, it, it is available in the census, but it wasn't used in the original analysis. Uh, happily, but it involves a certain amount of work, um, the census tract tabulations are fully available. So that all of the census tract tabulations from the original tables from the US 1970 census are available as PDFs. So that it's possible not just to take the, uh, the uh, published data set, including the, uh, the median, the weighted median uh, house value by census tract, but it's also possible to uh, add, which I've done, to the data set, counts of houses by, uh, by value class. So the value classes were the ones which are here, and those are the ones which are tabulated in the census itself, or the census results itself, so that it will say that in some cases it says star less than 5,000, which means that there was something there, but it's too small to, to print, but it was very often zero, and there were a number of cases which uh, Gilly and Pace had also recognized where the response was censored. That is, the housing value was 5,000 or 50,000, which means that all of the houses in the census tract were in the lowest category or the highest category, so we don't know what the median value is because the median value was, was at the limit on either end. There were two, the lower limit and, and um, 14 or 15 at, at the, top, the top level. So it was, so you go down to about 490 uh, observations after you've removed the, the 492, 493, 494, something like that after removing the, the census, census values. So this is the question which was asked, H, H11. And the, uh, the, the, um, there was also uh, an, uh, an error uh, which was corrected by, uh, by um, uh, Gillian Pace in the original uh, Statlib data, so that there's a, there's a, a corrected median uh, value uh, column there. Having the actual tabulations meant that it's possible to re-aggregate the data to the uh, air pollution model output zones, because they nest uh, exactly inside the they nest exactly inside the uh, the uh, um, the census tracts, or the census tracts nest within the model output zones, which is a little it's a little suspicious. They, my suspicion is that the model output zones were the towns in most cases, but not, not all. The air pollution data was, as I've said, uh, based on the use of the transportation and air shed simulation model, TASIM. And these TASIM zones for the Boston area uh, generate, there were 122 model output, model output uh, zones. And the values were then assigned, or st were stated in the, uh, in the Harrison Rubinfeld article to have been assigned proportionally. But in fact, they, what they did was they, they dropped down nicely onto the towns and then you just simply allocate exactly the same value to every census tract within that, within, within that town. The NOx values in the published data sets are in units of 10 parts per million and the model estimation uh, uses them in 
uh, sorry, in parts per, per 10 million were what, what were uh, published, and then parts per 100 million, so PP, parts per 100 million PPHM values, which is not a standard way now of, of handling, handling the data. It might, might rather be parts per billion. Uh, many of the uh, many of the smaller census tracts belong to the same TASIM zones, and uh, this is this is an obvious case of change of support, with very different statistical properties under the two entitation schemes. I think the missing reference there is to is to uh, my paper uh, from okay. So that so the missing reference is is one with with a good deal of of. So it's this this uh, revisiting the Boston data set. It's this so it's this this one. So this is this is the 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 website for the for the for the article. It's a, it's an open access article published by the uh, European Regional Science Association, and then this this uh, this uh, uh, goes through the. Uh, the uh, complete set of sort of describing where the data come from and and uh, all of that kind of kind of stuff. It then then uh, describes in detail how you would manage to 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 cover the uh, cover the uh, sort of address some of the problems which occur uh, in in handling the data. So the this is the uh, the the air pollution data. Uh, the uh, original reports, which were only available as uh, um, duplicated copies, uh, uh, I located some through a friend in, in Connecticut who then scanned uh, hundreds of pages of 1970 duplicated report and sent them to me, but they included the Fortran code for the models, including the model output. And if one then generated the boundaries uh, or reconstructed the boundaries from a Fortran common block, which was used to generate line printer maps, as the original report had just line printer maps. So you've got a, a 120 characters broad and then you is that so that each uh, each model output zone was allocated a uh, a number of character placings on a, a, a line printer printout, and you could work out from that w what the number of the zone was and where where the boundaries fell, and these were then the 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 numbers of the uh, of the TASIM zones going through to from from uh, one to one hundred and twenty two. And then 122 being 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 here being being downtown, or well, being being in in this area here. Down, downtown is there. I'm not all, I'm not terribly sure whether this is properly registered either, because I had it, I had to register it by 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 hand. So that having done that, then it it was fairly obvious what was going on. That the the the. Uh, the 122, um, the 122 uh, model output zones, actually only about uh, 96 of them overlapped the 506 uh, census tracts. Others were further to the uh, to the west, to the west and north and south of of the of the actual study area which was used. If we go back to the to the uh, to the data itself from the 506 um, census tracts, which were used in in the in in the um, in the analysis, we can see that we have a problem with quite a number of dropped census tracts downtown in Boston, because there were no houses of that kind uh, present. Uh, right censoring occurred. quite a large extent uh, in the area around the center and also towards uh, Harvard University uh, so that this is uh, this is um, 
Beacon Hill. Okay, so it takes about 10 seconds for my brain to get back there. Beacon Hill is sort of where the Kennedys had their townhouse. And so it's an expensive area. And so that all of the, all of the houses of this category reporting uh, in the 1970 census valued the, the property at over $50,000. So it's, it's right censored. It was, it was so all the houses were at 50000 or more, so you couldn't get a, a good fit on, on, the, on the, 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 the actual response of the value to, to air pollution. Uh, indeed, in this area, it, it's well above the NOx. And then there's a question as to whether there's not a missing uh, elevation uh, value. Because although this goes from sea level to the top of Beacon Hill, at the top of Beacon Hill, where the really expensive houses are, then you're usually probably above the worst pollution. So, but, so that, that knowing whether that response was, was, was homogenous across the census tract was, was, was not so easy to, easy, to, easy to see. Those of you who visited Boston will, will know where Beacon Hill is in, in relation to, 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 to downtown. So uh, one of the steps uh, that, that I took in the analysis in the 2017 paper was to aggregate all of the geometries to the model output zones and model everything from there because I could recreate exactly the response variable. So I could, I could get out the, the aggregate uh, medians by counting up each of the classes from the question and uh, then, then uh, conducting the aggregation on that basis, so that I could do the the weighted, the weighted median uh, on 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 the correct counts of uh, of houses. Um, so then I got I got uh, got up to got got down to ninety four uh, units of uh, observation. Um, if one looks at the at the NOx variable. Uh, this is then going from dark, which is, uh, which is, uh, and this is a standard palette, dark, which is a low level, and then going up to uh, a high level at, at uh, 0.85. And you can see that the, the higher levels are large. And this is after cutting out some of the bits. And you can see that many of the census tracts have identical. This is mapping the 489. So it's mapping the ones which remained after removing the censored census tracts. You can see here that the highest values are uniform across a group of census tracts. And that was because that was just one observation at the model output uh, zone level but multiple observations if you copied them out across the census tracts, which were then assumed to have exactly the same level of, of air pollution. It would, be would have been possible at the time to uh, smooth that spatial surface so that you wouldn't get these uh, uh, step drops between the model output zones, so that you could fit a surface across the the, uh, the 122 model output zones and then make predictions for the census tracts, which would have given a certain amount of, of local variability. But that, that smooth in itself would also have induced um, uh, would also have induced um, regularity in the surface. So that what we've got here is a surface surface which is uh, I. Uh, um, uh, maximum possible spatial autocorrelation within the block and then a step down or a step up to, to, to the next value in the next model output zone. Uh, so I've now move, moved way off. So this, this was the air pollution data. Uh, the other independent variables, the, the response was the median house values. We had the NOx, which we've talked about. And beside the NOx, there were other census covariates. They were observed at the census tract level. Uh, that's the average number of rooms per house, the proportion of houses older than 1940, the proportion of low status inhabitants, the black proportion in population in the tract, originally expressed as a broken stick relationship but here it's taken as a, as a as a percentage the reason for the broken stick 
in the original article was that uh, it seemed that uh, in areas with a majority black population, the housing market would behave differently at that time. Uh, but but moving to percentage uh, it, it does, doesn't make a difference. There's a crime rate which is untraceable. It's said to be taken from FBI data, but it's by town, not by census tract. In the paper, uh, on the other hand, if you look at the data, it varies by census tract. So I don't know where that came from. So in the paper, they say in the, the 78 article, they say uh, this is FBI data. It varies by town. But when you look at the values, it actually varies by census tract. So I don't know what they were doing there. Uh, the distance from the track to employment centers is the distance to downtown is, is taken from other sources. And there's also a dummy variable for tracts bordering the Charles River, because if you have a view of the Charles River, then then uh, your value was considered to be to be enhanced. Uh, and the Charles River was not part of the dock, so the Charles River was was uh, inland from where the dock stopped. Uh, other covariates defined by town, uh, the um, the ones. Uh, De, 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 de defined by town include the proportion of residential lots zoned to be over uh, 25,000 square feet. Zoning means that the planning authorities can determine uh, the lot size of houses and if the lot size is large then by definition you make it impossible for poor people to live there. And in US planning situations, this is, a, this is a typical. So that if you want to make sure that poor people stay away, you make sure that the lot size is big, which means that the properties are going to be, by definition, expensive. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, the proportion of non-retail business uh, acres, so places which are industrial, um, which is by, in, by township, access to radial highways, the full value property tax uh, rate per uh, $10,000 and the pupil teacher ratio by town school district so so the, the, those are the other variables which they consider so you can see that they're they're trying to take account of uh, the, the the particular qualities of the houses so rooms and and so on so on so on and then something about the 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 environment the the community in which the house is located and, and so on and it appears that the so that of the 96 tasim zones which are included in the in the uh, in the 506 census tracts uh, which were analysed, about 80 of them match the towns uh, uh, exactly. The remaining 12 towns and 16 tasim zones, there are some overlaps, and in which case uh, um, the tasim zones for analysis probably are okay. We don't know what those overlaps are because we can't exactly register the boundaries of the census tracts against the boundaries of the uh, uh, of the model output zones, which we don't know exactly. Uh, the creation of the maps, which you've seen here, uh, occurred uh, by... Uh, I was contacted by, by um, uh, Anthony Unwin, who's a professor of statistics and particularly in statistical graphics, as to whether I knew of, of a way of representing the census tracts as polygons because the original or the data set as augmented by uh, Gillian Pace only included points. Uh, and we didn't really know what the points were. If you try to map them, they end up in the harbour or about 30% about of the points end up in the, in, in, in the Atlantic or in the Bay. So that obviously the, the, the relative positions of the, the points are about right. So if you just make a graph of the points, you're about right. But if you try and put it on a web map, it, you end up in the harbour. I, I did that putting them on Google Earth in 2003 in Vienna in a plenary at the, at the, the meeting, meeting there. And... Uh, but quite a lot of people, despite the fact that I was talking about lots of other things, the, the only thing they remembered was that the data, data set had the census tracts in the harbour. Uh, however, 
so that so that Anthony Unwin had found out that this was the case, and he and Bill Venables wanted to know whether it was possible to to reconstruct the actual census tract boundaries. So while I was at a conference in Columbus, Ohio, at a university which then had access to to all of what one needed, uh, so I was able to download uh, tabulations between the. Uh, between the 1980 census tract boundaries and the 1970 census tract boundaries and to get the maps sort of downloading them from the US census to be able to reconstruct the uh, both the, the the boundaries and the and the the uh, the IDs the keys for the census tract numbers themselves so it was possible to join the two join the map onto the onto the the, the data that now we have uh, the data set uh, as you see it, which has been extant for about uh, four or five years, but hadn't hadn't been used used as such uh, before that. So you can s probably see where I'm going with multi-level. So that with multi-level, what I feel that we have is a choice. We well, there are, there are three possible choices. We could stay with the original resolution of the data. So we've got the census tracts. But then we have a problem which we may need to resolve through uh, instrumenting or a, a hierarchical Bayesian model where first we model the uh, NOx and interpolate it to the census tracts and carry through the interpolation error in making a further analysis of the housing values related to that, to that variable with the other Covariates taken into account. So that would be one possibility. Another possibility, which I addressed in the 2017 paper, was to uh, re aggregate the data so that the data were aggregated uh, to the uh, model output zones so that the response, the, the weighted mean house values, were aggregated correctly. The other covariates were. Uh, they were I used a weighted weighted average rather than the weighted mean weighted average in the other cases, uh, where obviously the weighted average for a township for which there's only one township inside or the so that worked out quite well in the two thousand and seventeen paper. I was able to demonstrate that the willingness to pay for air pollution had probably been underestimated by a factor of three. In the original paper, the willingness to pay for, for a, 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 a unit decrease in air pollution in the units in which it was then, then, then defined was about $1,400, which in 1970 was, it was, a, was a certain amount of money. And, I, and once I'd re-aggregated, re although obviously the coefficients were not as significant, they were much larger. And this was also taking into account uh, the, the possibility that um, there was spatial autocorrelation present in the residual, which there was with 506 or 489 observations, there was substantial spatial autocorrelation present in the residual. So move to a spatial Durbin model, there's still spatial autocorrelation present in, in, in the residual. But when I went to the SLX model for the 94 model output zones, there was very little or no residual spatial autocorrelation so that you could go just with a, with a, with a regular SLX uh, model. So that's including the Xs and the WXs. And then looking at the impacts of the, of the uh, NOx, uh, using the impacts of the NOx, then then you got something around around four thousand uh, dollars per 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 unit improvement in 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 uh, in air pollution. And a, a further feature was that the air pollution was modelled in the original paper by its square rather than uh, as a linear relationship. Although we haven't been able to substantiate that this was a sensible choice. So, that, but yes. Zero. 
which was what I expected. No, as was, I'm, I'm sort of trying to clear up messes from sort of if if you're going to leave the stable, you might as well clean it before you go and put the the lock on. But so it, is, what I was trying to establish was: is this a spatial story with spatial autocorrelation and so on, or maybe is it an entitation story? And entitation stories are, as in one case, Badi Baltaji told me, you seem to prefer no story stories. Yeah, the, the, is this is the tendency to, to is the question is about reproducible research, so that so that the seventeen paper essentially uh, questions uh, the Harrison Rubinfeld conclusion, says that the willingness to pay for uh, for uh, abatement uh, was in nineteen seventy in Boston substantially higher than the original paper. However, I'm now about to destroy all of that because when I go multi-level, I can't distinguish between the uh, IID random effect for the multi-level <coughs> and the NOx because the NOx is being ob observed at the upper level so that distinguishing between what you could say identifying between the values of covariates observed at the upper level and the fact that they they are upper level units uh, is it, it's convoluted. So they get, one gets mixed up with the other. But that, actually, that, that's that's an idea. So that, that when I retire, perhaps I can try and do a, a sort of pitch this as as reproducible research rather than saying this is this is indicating that spatial autocorrelation may also be associated with an entitation problem, which is probably something that about as many people as the as the log, as the log Jacobian audience is interested. Yes. Yes, it's very widely used for testing things, yes. And the nature article of what they expressly reproduce in the North Face psychology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they found that 60% of those could not be reproduced in the source one. Yes. And that's a massive fraction, so I think for the data set or the most famous data set, there are the old versions of people who use it. It's probably getting some of the fraction. Well, you can reproduce the same results using the same methods that they use, okay. so that that works. Yeah, but 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 if you then if you then question which uh, Gillian Pace did, Gillian Pace questioned whether the emission of uh, of the spatially autocorrelated uh, residuals, omitting the fact that the residuals were spatially autocorrelated, which in 1978. Cliff and Ord had been out for five years, so that if they looked that way, then they might have thought that they should check the residuals. But there were different literatures they didn't know. Uh, discovering that there was spatial autocorrelation in the residuals took another, another 20 years, so this is 1996, 1997. Uh, but then the data set was already being used by lots of people who were totally ignoring the fact that it was spatial uh, and can have continued to do, do, do that. And uh, it, was, it was only when I, when I was trying to find out where the... the as it, what I did was, was look at the number of unique values of NOx and I found that they were relatively few. And I said, OK, per perhaps they just rounded the model output. But then you wouldn't get these blocks on the map. So then I wanted to get back to the original reports, which were all of it was properly documented in the original article. So you, you did know where to go from the original article. They they were doing it, they were trying to do a good a good job. Uh, and found out so how the model was organized and, and how the model output was. And at the time it would be very difficult to do anything else. As nobody really would would have known at the time how otherwise to get uh, values or disaggregated values across an urban area of NOx loadings, annual NOx loadings or particulate matter loadings. But anyway, I'll I'll get uh, uh, I'll I'll think about that. 
because it it might be fun to try to present it as a as a, a reproducible research problem. Uh, I think my tendency would be to say that we're in an area where we don't know enough to be able to to argue. Uh, so I think we're in a situation of not binary cannot be reproduced. We can reproduce it, but that the original model was misspecified. If we try to re-specify it, then we could choose to, to, to do that by instrumenting the, the variable, in which case we probably find nothing. We can choose to do it by uh, uh, aggregating to the model output zones, and then I get a, an, a helpful and interesting result, particularly because I would be personally committed to seeing willingness to pay values being much higher, not that I would be necessarily enormously in, interested in, in paying more local tax to, <laughs> to permit the abatements to take place, but I do use public transport regularly, so that, that's okay. Um, but, and then the third one was say was maybe this is a multi-level problem. And the multi the, the multi level uh, article is also a, a 2017 uh, paper, but it's not open access. So, uh, so that the the 2017 stuff is Uh, let me find it or not. This one. So that this is this is Elsevier. So it's not. It, if if you're online here, then then this is this is accessible. It's a comparison of estimation methods for multi-level models, where Jay Shah was a doctoral student of Brian Ripley and had been working on on maximum uh, on uh, Monte Carlo maximum likelihood which was a method from the 1990s which had been eclipsed by uh, uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo and which, uh, which she was interested in investigating further and, and, and Brian Ripley said, okay, let's go for it. So there is a package called uh, M, uh, I think it's called MCL car, um, yeah, Monte Carlo likelihood uh, car for fitting for fit, fit, fitting uh, models which don't necessarily have to be have to be uh, multi-level but uh, uh, changed it to, to, to make it possible to fit multi-level models then uh, uh, Ingrid and leave uh, work in in uh, in uh, in Haugesund. there's, there's a, uh, a, a, a spatial interaction modeling community in based in Haugesund. Uh, where they were m initially mostly concerned on uh, uh, attempting to estimate the effects of changes in the transport network for labour markets, housing markets, and things like that. Uh, so that uh, Lee Vosland and uh, Ingrid Sandvik Torsten had been already working on on uh, using car models, multi-level car models for housing data. Uh, at the same time, another paper appeared, or another series of papers appeared by um, uh, a man who, whose uh, English forename is, is, is Gavin um, Dong. Uh, all of all of these these are then then um, in 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 the references. So that there was work, there was extant work by. Uh, by uh, Osland and so that there was this this article here in the Journal of Regional Science accounting for local spatial heterogeneities in housing market studies uh, there was effect on housing prices of urban attraction and labor market accountability and environment and planning uh, so that both of those were, were good articles this was a recent one the one involving uh, Ingrid and so they drew my attention to the, 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 so the, that it would be interesting to be doing this, this, this kind of thing. And then there were the, this is the um, Monte Carlo Maximum Likelihood with Geyer, Geyer and Thompson. Um, so that then there, there was, 
uh, a cluster of articles by uh, Dong and Harris and, and uh, Richard Harris and uh, Ke uh, Keith Jones. Uh, the, the, these two are in at the University of Bristol in the, in the uh, and have been working in. Uh, Kevin Kevin Jones. Uh, Kevin's been working multi-level modelling since forever, a really long time. And the the point about multi-level modelling is that, um, as it's used, say, in, in education and similar similar circumstances, is that when we we have our W matrix, then, as you saw the plots yesterday, then you get a sort of pe peppery uh, around the... around the principal diagonal. What happens in multi-level model is that you get solid blocks of interaction down the principal diagonal. So that if you think of this as being a school, then this is class one, class two, class three, class four, and class five. So that all of the pupils in a given class interact with one another. But they don't interact across class boundaries, but you could have a, a class effect, it's the higher level effect, and you can then embed this in a, an, another level above that. Uh, it's also possible to have cross-level effects, and this is something like a cross-level... So if you talk to a, uh, a, a multi-level modeler, they'll say, well, you're, you've got a very complicated cross-effect um, going on here, and in fact you can estimate the spatial regression models using multi-level modeling software. Um, there's an article by Henk Vollmer and co-authors uh, do doing that, which did that for so, some, some time ago. But anyway, this, uh, this article gave us, uh, gave us uh, an opportunity to try out a range of uh, different approaches. The data which was being used from the Stavanger housing region could not be published. It was individual properties with, with values. But the, uh, the articles by Dong et al. For, uh, with land parcel prices in Beijing uh, were available so that the article has, has uh, um, first an example using the Beijing uh, land parcel price data, which is a two-level model, and then using a, a similar two-level model approach for, uh, for uh, Stavanger, where we get, in the end, uh, we get... So the, these are the alternatives which we're trying the multi-level uh, multi approaches uh, using um, uh, Winbugs, uh, Bayzex, Inla, HSAR, which is the package written by, uh, written by um, Dong et al., uh, MCL car, uh, HGLM, which I was talking about bef before the break, use it, and for, uh, for just for IID uh, uh, random effects, uh, LME4 and uh, Bayesian LME. So that the, the, that's that, that's that's an article which is which is uh, discussing and describing m many of many of these uh, many of these uh, approaches, and then the the the. So there are descriptions of the different um, different uh, methods. Then there's a description of the Beijing uh, data set, uh, as included in the uh, PILOS article by Dong et al., and uh, is included in the HSAR package. And so that we then, then get uh, the... Um, the uh, sorry, so the, this, the, the, these, these were the locations of the land parcels for which we had data at the lower level. And at the upper level, these were the boundaries of the districts. And uh, this then provided us with, with a framework for setting up uh, so the, the estimates of the coefficient for six implementations of the multi-level spatial regression model standard errors in parentheses. So we could, could look to see whether we were getting similar values for the, for the, um, for the coefficients at the upper level and the lower level. 
and as you can see, all of the methods are, are giving us very similar, uh, very similar values. It was also helpful in the development of the M uh, MCL car package uh, because it had something to run against to to, to cross check uh, what was going on. So those are the same kind of caterpillar plots that. One of the things we did find in the article was that um, MCL car and uh, and um, HGLM were more sensitive to uh, odd observations. As an observation where there was uh, where the uh, the upper level and lower level had this, so the upper level contained one lower level unit, and maybe that lower level unit had somewhat unusual values of the covariates. In the Stavanger case, they were upper level units which were very rural and had only a few house sales registered, so that there was more noise in those. And they, the, those values then in, in fitting the model were, uh, were visible in, 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 in uh, the correlations between the uh, spatially structured random effects. If we got the so summary measure for the for the uh, random effects for the Beijing districts and so on and so forth. So we were uh, the, the, this is the apparently fitted spatial parameter in in these cases. They're they're very similar across uh, across these here, and these are the the partitioning of of the variability in 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 the data. And they're they're, they're differently scaled in in the, in this case the. Uh, this 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 row is differently scaled across the 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 implementations and then there was the stavanger data set which is a much larger data set uh, but with fewer upper level upper level uh, units um, and so on so the the paper describes all of that in 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 uh, considerable uh, detail so back to boston so that uh, on the basis that 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 uh, uh, we knew where or had a feeling for where where things were going multi level uh, i then said okay i've now got a, a successful result in the 2017 paper indicating a willingness to pay with a significant coefficient on the air pollution variable but maybe maybe I should try out the 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 multi level uh, multi level approach. So uh, this is re reproducing uh, where we were previously, generating the neighbors at the upper level. Uh, there was, however, a problem which only appeared in multi level that one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, outcomes of the re-aggregation was that we ended up not with 96, but with 93. or well, not with 94, but with 93. And then with, with uh, 487, uh, 487 um, uh, census tracts still included. The problem was that uh, while some of the approaches using spatial regression modeling tolerate no neighbor zones or graphs divided into multiple graph components others do not so that some manage that others don't we don't really know why this is it may be that something in the implementation in one case assumes that the graph has no subgraphs uh, but in other cases that assumption is not made or it doesn't bite uh, so that so that so that we don't see anything happening. Okay, so that we've got here the the um, this is the map of NOx values across uh, the 408 the now included 487 uh, 487 census tracts. We've now got quite a lot of fallout because we've got some here which have dropped out. So the multi-level spatial model is following the the general approach which was used in the in the uh, 2017 paper in region uh, with the same formula. But here we've got uh, instead of uh, 489 or 94 observations, 96 observations, we've got we've got uh, um, 487, and at the lower level we've got we've got 93. So that we we can uh, we can um, 
uh, proceed. Um, the, the presentation here isn't complete, so I didn't go through all of the possible varieties which are present in the, in the uh, two 2017 papers. Uh, but is so if you look at the residuals from the um, cross sectional model that's taking everything at one level, we can see as was also found by uh, Gillian Pace that the, the, there does seem to be a lot of spatial patterning in the residuals, and there must be information which can be retrieved in this but is this perhaps is this perhaps simply uh, idiosyncratic random variability across the census tract. So that one thing we could do would be to try out uh, a, a, an IID random effect across this using uh, 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 ELMA from the LME4 package. What you can see below the fitting of the model is totally irregular but I don't have another handle on it, which is how do you test the residuals of a non-OLS model for residual spatial autocorrelation? This isn't a good way of doing it, but, but we don't have anything else. To, and it appears that uh, inserting into the formula this random effect, IID random effect, so there's no relationship to neighbours, nothing, reduces the apparent spatial autocorrelation from very large to pretty trivial. You could say that the residuals were still autocorrelated, but they're not, they're not, they're not strongly autocorrelated. So that there's something here which perhaps is an idiosyncratic effect now, try and publish that in a journal called Spatial Economic Analysis. So you, you can't. <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't a spatial story. However, I'm trying to be uh, um, respectful to the data. And, and the, this, this finding, I think, is in itself interesting because sometimes things which appear to be spatial stories, you're using a test for spatial autocorrelation, are actually revealing some other heterogeneity in, in the data. Now, whether this is coming from measurement error, whether it's coming from uh, from missing covariates, it's very difficult to know. But there's something else. Uh, it, it's not immediately obvious that this is this is uh, this is uh, this is a spatial story. Uh, I'll come back to the coefficient estimates uh, in in a little while uh, on on the NOx variable. Uh, we could also uh, set up uh, the uh, spatial weights for... Um, we've already generated the spatial weights, but we need to generate a model matrix for the, for the relationship between which census tract belongs to which spatial entity at the upper level. So this is what we're doing here, is we're generating a, a model matrix using the model dot M big M, and we're converting it into a, a, a sparse matrix. So this is this is a sparse model matrix showing how the uh, how the lower level entities fit into the upper level entities. We didn't need to do that here because this generates it internally, but in in HGLM and HSAR it doesn't. They don't. Is is that? In, uh, the NOx ID is the uh, identity of the model output zone. Okay. Yeah. So that here across the across the 487, we've got 93 different values. So that, w that will then uh, allocate uh, each census tract to the appropriate NOx uh, the model out uh, air pollution model output zone. So that you end up with if if you generate a dense matrix. So you'd get zero if the census tract belongs to a different, for that column, zero if it belongs to a different uh, air pollution model output zone, and one if it belongs to that model output zone for that column. So you've got uh, 93 columns 
and 487 rows, indicating the allocation of the census tracts to model output zones. And some of those may be questionable. There were, there were, uh, there were uh, 16 census tracts where it wasn't immediately clear uh, how far they overlap between, between model output zones. Uh, so that uh, setting up the the, the, the the sparse design matrix, and then this shouldn't be displayed, and then we get on to using HGLM. So then there's some information that HGLM comes back and talks about itself, and we need to generate some of the some of the the um, other elements to pass them through in. Uh, in non this this is this is this is an example using a non formula interface so we've got the y's we've got the x's and we've got the delta and this will give us an iid so it gives us the same as as elmer gave us so we're fitting an iid to this and we can see that once again this is a slightly different fit but there is very little spatial spatial autocorrelation in the residual from this model fitting the regular covariates, the ones which are in all the models, plus an IID random effect. So the IID random effect in, in both using ELMA and using HGLM is, is it's, it's, it's removing almost all of the spatial dependence in the residual. If we fit a, 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 a simultaneous autoregressive model in the error but at the upper level using uh, using HGLM, uh, we we get, we get a, a result indicating that that we've got even less spatial autocorrelation, but there isn't a great deal of difference. So that, again, distinguishing between which of the outcomes are related to the idiosyncratic random error random effect for each of the uh, observations and which is related to the fact that a given uh, model output zone borders another model output zone there isn't a great deal going on there it's difficult to tell what 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 this might be so if we take the unstructured random effects the the iid random effects for the tasim zones th this is what they look like for for mlm uh, this is from from lme uh, lmer this is from uh, HGLM. Again, some differences between the the, the uh, so crossing a class interval, but the general shape of the uh, of the map is 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 very similar. If we want, then want to use HSAR, um, and I've now generated an awful lot of mess here, which I shouldn't. I should have checked whether there was mess. Um, the the model is then being fitted with an upper level uh, weights matrix between the uh, between the model output zones and a delta with the model matrix d saying which uh, census tract fits into what which model output zone we're not using a weights matrix between the census tracts just just at the at the upper level this is mcmc and unfortunately each time it does the sampling, uh, it gives me a warning which I should have remembered to turn off. Oops. Okay, so we're down to there. So we can then take out the, the, uh, the um, stru spatially structured random effects, and we've got one from HGLM and one from uh, HSAR. And there isn't there isn't an enormous amount of difference. This one has a slightly darker colours here uh, for the same uh, breaks, the same same class intervals, so that there's something here which is in a different. So this is moving between this class and this class. So it's crossing it's crossing that boundary. So if one wanted to check. Uh, back against the uh, against the as a compare the tabular results, we'd probably see that that random effect was uh, estimated by HSR as being slightly closer to zero, and in HGLM it was slightly further away from zero, uh, and and the same th same thing uh, on on the other side. So this this one here is is a, a bit stronger compared to the same 
uh, the same uh, object here, the same, same model output. So we can use uh, base X for fitting the same model. In the base X setting, we, we apply a, a term here, which is a, a, a random effect, RE, random effect, so is IID random effect. This is Gaussian families. In the case of HGML and um, now going into base X, then we could have chosen to, in this case, we've got a continuous response. But if we had a discrete response, we would have been able to handle it uh, well here. Uh, run a Moran's test. We're getting the same the same results from these these ad hoc Moran tests. That that fitting a random error, uh, uh, an idiosyncratic uh, term, applying to each of the 487 observations is, sorry, to each of the 93 uh, uh, zones, is removing almost all of the spatial story in 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 the residuals. That could be seen in relation to the 2017 paper using the, the, the model output zones as the entities of interest most directly. That actually moving to that representation removes most of the spatial autocorrelation from the residuals because those models had very little or no spatial autocorrelation in the residuals. However, here we've got the, the lower level things going on, but it turns out that most of the most of the spatial autocorrelation in the residuals can be removed by attaching an upper level random effect. So the, the, the spatial autocorrelation is largely eliminated uh, by, or is largely, it, it disappears, it goes away. Uh, if you include a, 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 an IID random effect at the upper level. So this, the, these have been my responses to the correspondent on uh, on uh, RSIG Geo who has two and a half million uh, Airbnb uh, Airbnb um, uh, lettings, uh, but 170 something zip codes in uh, Greater New York, and my response has been: Please do try a multi-level model because probably the spatial relationships between the lettings, many of which is, th there are uh, geographical coordinates for the lettings, but many of the lettings are repeat lettings. So the, it's the same apartment being let time and again in different configurations, but it's in the same place. Um, probably most of the spatial story, if there is a spatial story at all, is at the upper level, and maybe you don't even need a spatial story at all. Maybe you can, Maybe you can just run a uh, a, a, a regular uh, regression and be done with it. But it, it, it's a bit hard to test for spatial uh, uh, autocorrelation in the residuals. Uh, that could be done. But possibly just go for a, a, a multi-level, uh, go for a multi-level model at the at the 170 something. So that doing a random effect. The the the. Um, the model mate, the sparse model matrix will be a beast. It will be large because you've got two and a half million rows and and uh, you've got uh, 170 columns to allocate the the lettings to zip zip codes. But prob my guess would be that, that 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 will that will get almost all of the way there. Uh, without uh, needing to say that, well, I have to do spatial regression because it's spatial data, and this I think is where I'm where I'm getting to is that just because you have spatial data, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the uh, the uh, um, dominant component of the data generating processes in play. It may be one of the uh, uh, components in the data generating processes in play, but it's probably or you can't know in advance that it's definitely the dominant one which is going to uh, drive your choice of methods to, 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 to use. I also suggested running it on one borough first to, just to get a feel for, <laughs> for what the data look like because, because it, it, it's much simpler to correct a model which doesn't run through the weekend and then fails. Uh, so if you do it on a little bit of the data. But, but so, far, so far we're still playing um, ping pong 
it, it's quite slow. It takes about a week for the ball to get over the net and come back again. So, so I'm trying to persuade him to, to try out a multi-level model because I think that there may not, in the end, be a, an enormous spatial story in this. Because so I think once you've taken account of the of of the of the uh, uh, let size and uh, probably there isn't going to be a great deal of difference. Yes. If if you are in a, I'm not sure about IID. I'm not sure that you can run IID on on multiple cores. Uh, the uh, the underlying question is one from a 2010 working paper, uh, and it's sort of echoed around since then. Uh, which so the question was about parallelization and would that help with, with large data sets? If you can chunk the data, as you would say in uh, big LM, big GLM, then uh, you're using... Um, Givens rotations is the the technical term, so that you 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 accumulate the uh, the the cross products of y and the y's and the x's, and so you only need to read a row of data at a time because you're accumulating the uh, y y y x x x uh, matrices as you step through. So that using Givens rotations, that then you can do quite a lot and and. Uh, uh, you can't do the same thing using QR. R uses QR for most of these things. But Big GLM tries to do it so that you update the QR uh, going through, so that you can do that. So that you can do big chunks and parallelize across cores. Now, the question you then need to answer is, if I'm going perhaps to choose to use a parallelized linear algebra library, so that's at the bottom and not at the top. Maybe that will give me the same input because for each linear algebra operation, the linear algebra uh, uh, subroutines will themselves parallelize across the number of cores that you've requested. And for instance, if you install Microsoft's uh, OpenR, which is a, it's a nice piece of software, but they build it against uh, uh, Intel's, I said but, and they build it against Intel's MKL multi-core blast. Okay, so that if you're running that and you haven't restricted the number of cores, then at each step in the internals of the algorithms at which linear algebra is being used, and in most statistical computation, linear algebra is being used most of the time, then you benefit from the cause anyway. And no, the, 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 historically, one would have done that by doing Givens rotations, so that even on a hand calculator, you could calculate quite big regressions because you were uh, iterating through the data set. You never needed to read more than one row of the data at a time. Uh, and that was very effective, and it's used in a number of different settings, sort of. But it's it's from it's it's fr it's it's from the the the, the algorithmic archaeology department. But the, the 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 there were algorithms developed during the 1970s which were really smart at handling fairly large data sets with very limited machine resources. And the Givens rotations was one of these, that, that instead of generating the X prime X matrix uh, by taking X and uh, transposing it and multiplying it by X to get the X prime X, then you could get the same thing by doing it row by row. And th those, were, those were the Givens rotations. So that was the trick which was used in some of these cases. And Big LM does some of these kinds of things, but now you, you would sort of say take in a chunk of data to avoid the, uh, the slowdown of having to go out and read data each time through. So you're looking at a, a stream of data coming through, but where you, only, or where you attempt only to keep the, 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 the cross products 
uh, involved in, 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 in the calculation. So most of these things can be done. The question is, how can you handle them in a situation where you need to address po possibly multiple mis misspecification issues at the same time? And uh, uh, Giuseppe Arbia claims that spa spatial econometrics probably hits a limit at about 70,000 observations simply because uh, in his case, he claims that there are uh, computational issues my feeling would be that, is that, do we know what the signal to noise ratio is in the data? And so what could we do to reduce that? Could we sample from the data? As I remember asking Brian Ripley 15 years ago about sampling from data when there, was, there were large data sets. And he said, that, yes, of course, in general, sampling from the data or bootstrapping from the data. It's running multiple analyses, and so you've got an ensemble of analyses from the same data set, and if the coefficient estimates are very similar, then, then you're done. So you, you don't have big data, you've got lots of analysis model results coming out of analyses of parts of the big data. And, and, and for spatial, it's a bit difficult because, because you need to take account of the fact that uh, different areas may behave differently. Uh, but Brian Ripley did add an important footnote, which he'd found in working with insurance data, was that some claims are very, very rare. And then maybe you do need 70, 000, sorry, 70 million observations. You need 70 million observations because those cases are so unusual that if you looked at a, a small sample of the data, so if you looked at... at, at uh, 500,000 observations of 70 million, you might not hit more than one or two cases, which wouldn't be enough to infer from. So you did have, actually have to, to, to analyze the, 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 whole, the whole data set. Back to the, this, this uh, multi-level, um, Bayes-X gives us results which were fairly similar for the, for the, uh, for the um, IID case. We can also fit a car. This is an intrinsic car uh, with the MRF rather than the RE, uh, and then we add an extra, uh, an extra argument here to to pass through the graph of graph of neighbors. And once again, we find that almost all of the spatial autocorrelation in the uh, residuals has been removed. We can also fit a. Th these are the separate uh, model random effects. The, these were the random effects, the IID random effects, these are the spatially structured random effects. There are one or two changes in intensities across these. We can also, with Bayes-X, fit, fit a, a bessag york mollier model, which includes both the IID and the spatially structured in the same model. Once again, almost all of the spatial autocorrelation in the residuals has been uh, removed. And uh, if we look just at the BYM IID component, there is really very little going on at all. Uh, whereas there does seem to be much more going on, on the spatial side, but this is this problem of trying to identify which is IID and which is spatial, because the spatial is typically picking up most of the IID which is there anyway, because it sort of grabs the variability first uh, for reasons, again, which, which are not well studied. So we don't know why the BYM algorithm grabs the spatial first rather than saying, OK, so we should look first at the IID, and once we've dealt with that, we'll look at the spatial. So it grabs the spatial first, and that is already... So you can see that the, that the spatial sort of includes, wraps up in itself uh, variability, which was probably... Uh, which was probably idiosyncratic to the... to, to, to the... Uh, to the um, model output zones. So if we then look at the error bars on the coefficients from these, this is the OLS value, this is the value from the original paper, it's about this, from, from the original paper. Uh, we know that the value found by Gillian Payson, which we can reproduce exactly, lies at about uh, 0 .0, minus 0 0.003, so it's about there, but it's still significant, but if we look at the NOx coefficients from all of the multi-level models, whether they're spatial or non-spatial, we end up in exactly the same place. 
these coefficients are not significant. They they bounce about a bit. Some of them, the the MRF here and the BYM uh, are um, the ones which are which which have the least the, the the value closest to zero, and then you get a set of the uh, IID and the SAR uh, values and the CAR value here from from base X. So it's a sad story. So that the, the what would be the willingness to pay here? I mean, you could you could persuade rich people in Boston to pay pay for abatement of air pollution. But you couldn't necessarily base it on uh, the use of fairly uh, sophisticated models, because unfortunately we can't disentangle the idiosyncratic and spatially structured upper-level effects from the coefficients of variables observed at that level because the, the NOx was observed at that level and not at the census tract level. If we say that the real uh, uh, choice was between using the census tracts and then trying to accommodate for the fact that they were misspecified by being over-disaggregated and aggregate to the... Uh, aggregate to the perhaps I should go back to the... the um, uh, 2017 paper to give you a happy story so we don't want sad stories uh, this was this one so that here if I if I if I uh, go down to the similar similar kinds of, of things these are the these are um, the two sets of models for for, for different different uh, models uh, uh, weighted and unweighted census tract models and weighted and unweighted TASIM zone models um, for the uh, for the NOx uh, models. Here we've got OLS and spatial error model. Uh, this is the SLX and uh, uh, the equivalent um, uh, 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 spatial Durbin error model. Uh, in 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 those cases for the for the um, so that A and B are for the uh, so uh, th these are the coefficient values these are the direct indirect and uh, total impacts and what we see is is a sh shift and these are for the uh, weighted and unweighted models we see that the models at the uh, at the level of the model output zone, so here are called TASIM zones, the coefficient values are substantially further from zero, uh, despite the fact that the so the the orange line is the is the coefficient from Harrison Rubinfeld. If we model with at the census tract level, we don't get very much further away from that, and the the error band around the the, the coefficients is is about what it was before, or rather worse, because we're taking account of the, the spatial story. But here you can see that the weighted and unweighted uh, variants for the, for the TASIM zones are giving us uh, coefficient values which are, which are, which are substantially further, uh, further out for the, total, for, 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 the, for the total impacts. So I was hoping somewhere I had a table for the... the this is the willingness to pay table. Uh, so that the the model as found for the census tracts uh, by Harrison and Rubinfeld uh, I'd have to read through the whole paragraph but the, the there's a description here of where where they were so they were equivalent to this about this one but if we use an SLX um, for the census tracts, we get this. If we use uh, a um, spatial error model, we get a reduced, and this would be the equivalent of the Gillian Pace uh, finding, that they have the willingness to pay. But if you use a spatial Durbin error model, this goes above the Harrison and Rubinfeld case. If you use case weighting or this weighting of the 
census tracts by the number of houses per census tract, which it seems to me is responsible to do, unfortunately you get a willingness, a negative willingness to pay when accounting for the spatial dependence. So theirs would drop to 640, so it would be halved by giving more weight to census tracts with more houses and less weight to census tracts with less houses. However, if we go with the, with the uh, weighted TASIM, the, this, the, the, these are the two that I prefer. It's around $4,000 uh, for the SLX and the, and the uh, uh, SDEM. If we look at just the OLS, there's still residual spatial autocorrelation, but including the uh, spatially lagged X variables clarifies the, 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 the issue. So that going from the, the total impacts in, in that case, it gives us a, a good deal of traction. Now, I could pitch this as the actual real deal so that uh, Harrison Rubinfeld's willingness to pay is unfortunately underestimated. However, how do you disentangle the fact that the NOx variable that we're using is both observed at a different uh, uh, aggregation than the, uh, than the census tract, so that's one problem. It's probably itself, um, um, I was going to say polluted, but, but there is a, there is a there's an, uh, 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 measurement error issue. So there's an errors in variables issue probably there because because they're using the output from model runs given calibrations and the, the, probably the actual values could, could take a distribution around the values which are, which are being used for the model output zones. It, uh, as we, when, when this was originally written, it was then, was then uh, the, the referees asked for it to be, to be uh, um, um, uh, heavily edited, then it started off by saying what's in what's in this paragraph um, is referring to Alan Wilson's uh, um, uh, chapter in 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 a book in in uh, in two thousand, and then reflecting uh, on the same kinds of things in two thousand two two thousand twelve. Uh, Alan Wilson, who is the author of spatial interaction modeling in in the modern age, so that his his work in from from sixty seven on entropy entropy modeling, as he, his approach was to say that okay we have entitation problems, but the way in which we handle them is by viewing unobserved movements of individuals as gas molecules, and then we can observe the state in cells of a channel with, through which gas is moving, so that you can aggregate them up. So that the number of trips from I to J can be related to the movement of gas. And we have equations for doing that. So he was using uh, entropy, entropy maximization for, for, for handling that. So it's an entropy modeling of uh, movement in uh, urban systems in particular. Um, Alan Wilson, I think he's still the... He, he's, he's a good 10 years older than I am. Although the, the first time I experienced a real... Uh, um, pop concert was when, as an undergraduate at Cambridge, Alan Wilson, who was uh, already recognised as, as an important figure, uh, was giving a talk to the students. So in getting into the lecture theatre was really hard. So that everybody wanted to be there, and the, 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 they hadn't they hadn't booked a, a, a larger uh, a larger lecture lecture theatre. I believe that certainly two years ago he was, uh, he'd been brought back from, uh, from retirement. He'd been vice-chancellor of the, of the uh, University of Leeds for a, for a period, served in, in that role for a period. Uh, and I believe that he is, he, he's um, uh, he's a director of the, of the uh, Turing Institute, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK machine learning, uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, research hub. So he's, he's, he's still active. But one, one, of, his, one of his insights um, 
uh, which he'd repeated for a long time. It's in his uh, books from the late sixties, where he talks about uh, uh, he talks about um, the three dimensions of uh, urban and regional analysis, but that applies to not just urban and regional analysis. The first is system articulation, then you get theory, and then you get method. And so much of what I've been talking about is in the intersection between system articulation and method. Are we measuring what we think we're measuring? Are we measuring or are the operationalizations of the measurements that we're making uh, in harmony with the theory? And he comes back to this time and time again. Are we actually, are the units of analysis that we're using compatible with the theory that we're trying to apply? Now, when he was dealing with, with entry, uh, 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 entropy maximization in urban regional modeling, then he was coming from theoretical physics. He's a physicist. So he knew his gas, and he knew his equations, and he knew the models that you could use for moving from what he was saying, okay, we've got the microstate, We've got the macro state. The micro state are the individual movements about which we know very little. The macro state is the level of energy in the system as a whole. But we need to allocate the molecules to cells to get them to where so you need to get from where you live to where you work. You need to get from either of those to where you want to go to the shops. So how do you do this, this modeling of transport modeling in a way which reflects what's going on? Previously, gra gravity models had been used. And the gravity models had run into the sound, sand because uh, you could never get the number of flows going in to match the number of flows which should have arrived. So you needed constraints. His models then included constraints, which were simply an, uh, an implementation of what he already knew from, from, from physical chemistry, from, from, from the physics of, of the movement of, of molecules and gas. But he had thought through the system articulation. And they, they did a good deal of work in Leeds during the, the, the 70s, when, when, when he'd, he'd moved as professor of geography to, to, to Leeds, uh, specifically on system articulation. So what difference does it make if we reorganize the, the units of observations? Uh, one of the papers which came out of that was Openshaw and Taylor. Openshaw was then at, at Newcastle, which is a million or so correlation coefficients. Uh, where the idea was that you re reorganize the counties in Iowa in different subsets, and you can generate... Uh, so that he said, okay, for transport modeling, what we need to do is generate a model setting which is optimally calibrated, which means we need to generate a regionalization, so going back to your question from, from Monday, a regionalization of observation units which optimizes the contrast between within group and between group variability. And so that what, what, what Openshaw and Taylor were, trying, were able to demonstrate was that by random reorganization of the counties in Iowa into groups, you could uh, arbitrarily generate correlation coefficients from 0 0.999 to uh, minus 0.997. Do you feel for a result with correlation like zero? Be my guest. Would you like strong negative correlation? Be my guest. <laughs> it's a bit the, 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 the gerrymandering uh, thing. So the, 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 by changing those uh, basic units that you're using, then you can, you can make it easier to calibrate the model so that for transport models, maybe you need to choose something other than the standard administrative boundary set up to, to, to make the model uh, to, to, to make the calibration of the models that the model forecasts uh, would be would 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 be would be more efficient. For point support is not such a problem, but much of the data that certainly in the social sciences that one deals with does face this problem of system articulation. And I would uh, say that 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 Wilson's continued uh, stressing of this uh, is is something which deserves at least little attention. And as I also noted in the article here, it does also point back to the original work in spatial econometrics by Palink and, and Niekamp. Um, in, 
ecology, there's been further work, which is also referred to here in the, in in the in 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 this paper by, for for instance, by uh, uh, Stefan Dre and and uh, co-authors, which is this. It's it, ecologists. I, I'm one of the co-authors too. Um, uh, they they write. You have a, a seminar workshop where you're working on stuff, and then everybody who came to the workshop becomes an author. So that that was fine. But this is is community ecology in the age of multivariate, multi-scale spatial analysis. And one of the things that ecologists have been concerned with, which uh, which uh, concern um, concerns system articulation intimately is the fact that different environmental processes have different scaled footprints. So that some of them may be just local and really don't go much beyond that. And others are much smoother and much, much broader. And when you're then attempting to integrate data to model, then essentially you want everything to be at one level or in multi-level settings, you want it to be at identifiable multiple levels. But sometimes it just doesn't work like that, that you can't get it all to fit together. Uh, as uh, one of the solutions then is to grid everything and try and handle the, the fallout from that. Uh, another solution which is in the Dre article is using uh, the, uh, the Moran eigenvector uh, approach. Um, I think it's also termed PCNM. I think another term in numerical ecology is PCNM. Yes, it's principal coordinates of neighbor matrices, which is exactly the same as taking the eigenvalues. So that is a different, uh, it's a different abbreviation of exactly the same thing. Uh, you find it in ADE spatial, for instance. Um, and one of the reasons why I started realizing that that uh, these things were were relatively uh, relatively controversial was uh, was that as soon as we got access to uh, to uh, uh, scientific uh, citations tabulations of scientific citations then I, I decided to check well who, who was citing me uh, this would be around 90, 90, 1991 92 when we had the first access the first uh, CDs with uh, listings were available and it was possible to go to the library and ask a librarian for help in analyzing who was who who's citing me so now you just go to google scholar and there you are um, with some constraints because i don't think they pick up citations in uh, say in china i don't i don't think they pick those up um, and i was extremely surprised to find that uh, a, a, a totally un, uh, inaccessible paper written, uh, it was written in 76 and came out in 1980 in English, but in a journal published by Polish Geography Department where I worked, uh, which was about the the uh, uh, inference from the correlation coefficient under spatial autocorrelation. And it was that the, the standard inference from correlation coefficient would vary if at least one of the variables was uh, autocorrelated. So, so I'd had this 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 article, and I'd assumed that nobody read it. I'd presented the work at a conference in Cambridge at which uh, Andrew Cliff was present, and so that they'd included a reference to my article in their book in eighty one. So they 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 had a page and a half re, sort of reproducing the results that I that I'd reach after they after they checked them that I hadn't made any any stupid mistakes. Uh, and uh, the number of citations for this uh, uh, article in a journal which could not have been accessible physically to any of the people citing it means that they must have cited it through Cliffenord 81. Um, but they were getting really agitated and angry with each other. And there was a group of ecologists who were saying spatial autocorrelation is not important. What is important is the scale of the ecological processes. It's not spatial autocorrelation. The problem is entitation. It's only entitation. And the others were saying, well, entitation's important, but even if we control for that, we're still seeing 
spatial autocorrelation. So that there were, if you like, there was a debate within numerical ecology about whether you should just look at scale or just look at spatial autocorrelation. And the upshot was the paper uh, where the lead author was Stefan Dre, where we tried to bring the two, two communities uh, together. And they were being brought together by saying, OK, Scale is important, autocorrelation is important, but using the principal components of neighbor matrices, that's using vectors extracted from the uh, doubly centered, centered uh, weights matrix, allow us to include, say, some eigenvectors, which are chosen for inclusion, will be more scaled than autocorrelation. So that they will be patches of the study area which behave differently. And others, will be more spatial autocorrelation so that you, you can attempt to bring the two together while empirically through the uh, eigenvectors of the weights matrices uh, accommodate the fact that entitation may not have been optimal. So that you try to account both for scale and for, and for uh, autocorrelation in, this, in, the same, in, the same, in the same setting. So that this article isn't too bad because it, it's got quite a lot of links to things which, which are probably important. But you can see this, this is now right at the end where they allowed me to keep it. Uh, and it's not at the very beginning where it was when, when this was written because it, the people said, you've said this before, we don't need to hear it. But I still think it's, I, I still think it's, it's, it's helpful because in a situation where your uh, out-of-the-can spatial model is not giving you informative outcomes, then maybe it's worth asking the question, is this, is this a system articulation problem? So are, are my observations uh, organized in such a way that they are capturing uh, um, salient features of the underlying data generation process? And if they are, then maybe you have a technical problem. If they're not, then one of the problems is a mismatch between the way the data are organized that you're analyzing and the underlying data generation processes that you were trying to uh, encapsulate. And where you, either for pragmatic reasons or um, uh, other reasons, have not been fully, fully successful. And then there are ways of patching it afterwards that you can, you can, so you've seen here, adding in the IID random effect more or less removes the spatial story. Now, if there was a spatial story, that shouldn't happen by itself. So maybe there isn't a spatial story, even though it's spatial data. On the other hand, there may, maybe there's something else there which is so that, that finding out which which of these say willingness to pay is is the one which is which is responsible to use it's not quite as bad as a million or so correlation coefficients uh, i think uh, i think uh, without trying to use evidence based measures simply from this data set it would be uh, entirely possible knowing what we know about urban air pollution to say that there are health costs. We have relatively uh, relatively uh, broad experience in handling the health costs. So we know more or less what kinds of things go on in, in this respect. Nobody's gone as far so far as integrating uh, prior knowledge into a Bayesian setting, which might might be a way forward. So that if if one was, so went on to the next bit here, which we're not going to get time to go on to. If you wanted to have an informative prior, saying what you would expect, so what would we expect knowing what we know about uh, uh, urban air pollution and uh, the exposure of uh, inhabitants of the city to urban air pollution, what would we expect to come out? And possibly to simulate from that from that model, or to draw from that model, to see whether you could recreate uh, what what you'd observed, that would that might be a way to go. But most of the most of the air pollution models are deterministic. There's been very little work done on ensemble modelling between empirical studies using 
the empirically collected monitoring data and interpolated data and the deterministic models. The deterministic models use things that we do know, that we know that the weather has an effect. If there's, if there's more wind, then there's much better mixing so that uh, ground level or one, two meter above the ground uh, today there's a bit more wind so that almost certainly the NOx levels in, in Bergen will be much lower than they've been for the previous week because the wind was, 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 was very, very, very light. Now the wind was a little stronger so that most of the, of the, the, of the uh, PM 2.5, PM 10 and NOxes, most of them will, will, have, been, uh, will have been blown away. Uh, so we do know deterministically how, how quite a lot of these things happen, but on average, in relation, say, to hedonic uh, models, um, we need to know something about when there's very little wind. If is it the case when there's very little wind that there's uh, that there are stronger emissions? Where are those emissions? What 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 do we see in traffic? We know that slow slow moving traffic is worse than than fast moving traffic. Things like th things like that, um, so that so that the idea that separate disciplines can jump in and solve things using only their own toolbox seems to be something of a problem. But most uh, grants are allocated by discipline, so or by groups of disciplines. So the, it is quite difficult in terms of of uh, funding the research which would be needed to do it properly to get things set up. It's, it's not quite silos, but it's at least uh, 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 not having the habit of asking enough people who, who might know, know about stuff. Uh, the notes below here go through experiments which I've been doing with, uh, with Virgilio Gomez Rubio using the Columbus data set, which is our, our, uh, Luke, Luke Anselin's data set, in a number, of, uh, a number of settings. So one of them is simply to fit a standard model using, um, using um, uh, among other things, maximum likelihood. So fitting a standard model using, using maximum likelihood. And uh, then seeing if the if the same results can be recreated using Bayesian approaches. So that the, in the uh, 2011 Google Summer of Coding, I mentioned that the 2010 Google Summer of Co Coding funded the, uh, the development of our GEOS. And then uh, Virgilio uh, with a, uh, a student worked on the Spatial Econometrics Toolbox uh, MCMC uh, model fitting functions, and they've now been folded into uh, spatial regs. So there's there's one for the error model, uh, which can also uh, possibly take a a um, a, uh, a Durbin term, uh, where the the output of the model is is organised as an MCMC object. The MCMC objects are defined in the coder package. And give you a standard uh, report on 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 the the, the 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 data. However, what what I was checking in this is whether the 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 way in which the 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 model is structured. In this case, it's using a grid of uh, uh, log uh, Jacobian values. Uh, Fits well or converges well, and the, this is a this is a test for the convergence of a of a, of a an MCMC uh, fit. This is with another variant uh, for the MCMC fit, and it also the the test shows that it does pretty well. But if we use uh, Metropolis Hastings for drawing the spatial uh, the spatial coefficient, uh, we find that there are as as also reported by. Um, so this is then looking to see whether the results reported by uh, uh, Lissage and Pace can be replicated. And they said that getting convergence with maximum with with, with Metropolis Hastings for sampling the spatial coefficient, you have to take more samples to get through. Uh, whereas if you're using the gridy Gibbs, that's using a grid of log determinant values, uh, then you then then it it it's it's a better behaved a better behaved setting. And then for Inla, uh, then getting to to the same model, you have some setup to do, and you can you can run 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 the this, the this, the same model, getting very similar fits for the for the for the different for the different coefficients.
One of the things that INLA does, uh, which is what we mentioned on Tuesday, is that sometimes it uses an internal representation of the coefficient values so that you see different coefficient values from the ones you want. So sometimes it, instead of allowing the coefficient to move between its across its natural domain, it will change the domain to uh, 0, 1. And then you have to change it back again. <laughs> To, to to get it back in, in into the into the input domain uh, and things like that. So there's, there's a certain amount of of insider information needed for for for, for, for this. So that's that's the the final bit of uh, of, of of script eight. Uh, if if you find that useful for for any purposes, probably nobody here is doing Bayesian spatial regression. I think nobody. Well, you you're doing some, but in a different slightly different setting. The, the 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 these are these are uh, they're not they're not experimental. We know that they work exactly the same as the or original MATLAB code, and they work also with quite big data. However, we haven't managed to implement parts of the MATLAB code which permit uh, uh, idiosyncratic uh, um, effects on each of the observations, which means that you're doing draws on all of the observations for each each time through, rather than just uh, on the uh, the regression coefficients sigma and uh, and the spatial coefficients. So that this is this uh, and is one of the things in R is to try to is if you're doing MCMC, it's very helpful to return the the object in in a form where it's easy to do diagnostic tests without having to write the di diagnostic tests oneself. Okay, so I'll conclude the, that on the in the, the, the sort of far reaches of of uh, uh, details of uh, spatial regression on on the Bayesian side. There are a number of other packages which which uh, provide for some of the Bayesian fitting mechanisms, but almost all of them are on the CAR side rather than on the SAR side. So that uh, uh, CAR Bayes, CAR Bayes ST uh, are fairly fairly. Um, Dependable on that that side. So car base is is also, for instance, used in the Australian uh, Health Atlas, which I, I don't think it's only cancer, but the, I think there are the, there are the complaints which are which are included in that. And and they said that they tried out worldwide so which which uh, functions can be used for creating spatial smooths, given the fact that in Australia you've got a number of very large cities, but you've got enormous Areas where the population level is very very small, so that the number of or the, the the rate the raw rate is very very va variable, uh, and uh, and then they they use this to create a, a, a fitted uh, value of the rate, uh, which is taking into account the uncertainty uh, around uh, a rate in a given year. Okay, so I'll. Turn off the...